Hey, how's it going? After the last run with Execute, I wanted to try something a little more relaxed. I had a commenter recommend either Nidoking King or Nidoking. Queen. While the differences in the two are pretty negligible, with Nidoking King favoring offensive stats, while Nidoking Queen favors defensive ones, as well as the Queen starting with a better starting moveset since it has Body Slam, I'm gonna go with Nidoking. King. I'm not gonna lie, it's my choice mainly for nostalgic reasons, because I can remember thinking that this was THE Pokemon to have up my sleeve back in the day. Since it had such a diverse moveset, and it was on all of my teams back when I was battling friends in middle school with Link Cables, remember those? It just had the answers for everything, except for Psychic Tops, but does anything really have the answers for that in Generation 1? Now if you are savvy with speedruns of Generation 1, you know that Nidoking is the Pokemon of choice for those types of runs. And you might think they choose it because it's easily accessible in the early game, it has a broad and diverse learn set, and it has balanced stats, and that's kind of true but you'd be completely wrong. At a certain point, those runs take advantage of a really broken combo brought to you by yet another generation 1 quirk. Enter X Accuracy. The first edition of this item made your Pokemon bypass accuracy checks and all of your moves would hit without question after you used it. The other side of this combo are the moves that knock out the opposing Pokemon in one hit, no questions asked, and normally they have the huge drawback of only having 30% accuracy. Nidoking conveniently learns two of these moves in Fissure and Horn Drill, which means that there's a point in the run where no matter what the battle is, you can just cheese the fight by just killing everything with no drawbacks. That's pretty neat. Right? Now so this intro doesn't go too long, I'm not going to deep dive into the stats, you can see them in the video. Nidoking does start off with 4 moves, and its TM and HM learn set is really massive, seriously this thing can learn almost everything. So my quest for today is to see how high up the tier list it can go with a wonderful move set. I'm very interested to find this one out. But before we begin, I do solo runs fairly often, so if that is of interest to you, consider subscribing to the channel. For small channels, likes and dislikes before they take them away I guess and comments help out the algorithm the most. So if you are just someone who doesn't normally interact or comment, just scroll down real quick and type Sofa King because I couldn't think of anything good and I remembered that one episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force with the Arise Chicken Witch Doctor. Give me a break. So without further ado, sit back, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's see how Nidoking King stacks up against the elite Pokemon in the previous runs that I've done. As usual, I reset for decent DVs, and let's just address the elephant in the room. Nidoking King suffers like a lot of Pokemon in the fact that it only has normal moves to use against Brock. If I want to get a competitive time here, I'm going to have to play perfectly and not waste any time. And that means that this run's toughest battles are going to be front loaded and it starts immediately as soon as I get into Viridian because I want to avoid any grinding of wild Pokemon and walking back here after the bug catchers to fight the optional rival battle would just waste precious time. This means that I need to take this optional rival battle out right now and this being my first real fight means that it's not going to be easy. I'm only level 6 so the damage is not the best but the reason this takes so many times to get past is all due to our old friend sand attack. And there are a few things in life that get me as frustrated as seeing this attack used multiple times. I hate it. This one takes a lot of resets and takes quite a while to get past but trust me when I say that it's pivotal to do this now so that I can min max any extra time I have to spend backtracking later. I'm committed to giving Nidoking King the best chance of those top Pokemon that I can. This fight does need some luck and luck isn't the worst thing in non elite 4 battles since I can just continually reset but you definitely need some crits here and it's not too bad since Nidoking's King's 85 base speed means that they come in at a 16.6% rate and that's not too bad that's about 1 out of 6 or 7 in terms of chances. Outside of that there's really not much strategy here you just try to avoid sand attacks or hope that you don't miss and then just pray for that crit so you can get to the squirtle with decent HP and from there you can do whatever you want. Horn attack is more consistent but some thrash crits can end pretty much any battle very quickly but confusing yourself voluntarily can cost you the battle since only being level 6 means that you don't really have much room for error. Eventually things go our way and you can see that we go from level 6 
to level 9 in this one battle. And why is that? Well friends, this is because Nidal King is in the medium slow leveling group. Don't let the name fool you because I believe that this is actually the fastest leveling group to get to level 25 and that is a major boost in a solo run since normally being about level 50 is where you end at the Elite 4 before you use candies. Now from here, I only battle the 3 bug catchers in Viridian and the junior trainer in Brock's gym. I do not battle a single wild Pokemon and this is as good of a time as any to talk about Thrash. It's a move stronger than Body Slam and equal in base power to Psychic at 90 but once you use it you'll get locked into it and it'll repeat itself for 3 or 4 times and then you'll self inflict Confuse on yourself. This move varies from Suicide to Extremely Efficient in fights since those extra turns don't use additional power points. It really shines in some early battles when the opponent only has two or three weaker Pokemon since you can just one shot all of them and not have to worry about the drawback. It's my personal first time utilizing it and it's pretty great on regular trainers. So this leads us to Brock. My time is pretty good here. I've been really efficient with my early game pathing but at the end of the day we are still a Pokemon with only normal moves and I'm trying Brock at level 13. And this fight is about as difficult as the starting optional rival fight and the fact that you need some luck but I'm committed to doing this now now and not grinding for two reasons. One, I feel like it's possible given enough tries unlike a run like Garatina where I just didn't see it happening and I had to go grind. The second reason is that this is a defining moment of the run. If Nidal King can squeak this one out, it'll be in the driver's seat and it can just run through the rest of the game and I want to see how fast this can be. Since we don't have any non-attacking moves, this fight is difficult. Just like the rival's Pidgey earlier, crits are a huge help since it'll bypass the defense card curls. I messed around with a lot of openings. Thrash does the most damage and if you can get off at least one crit and not hit yourself afterwards, that's probably the best option. This is easier said than done. I spend a lot of attempts getting chipped down very low before I even make it to the Onyx and this is where the majority of the attempts failed and that's not surprising if you watch the other runs with Pokemon that only have normal moves. Ultimately, this one's going to come down to luck once again. I keep chipping away at the fight and the strategy that ends up working and what is key here is making sure that you use poison sting during the bad turns so that you can take a lot less damage since poison is double resisted and can actually do zero damage in generation one. On my final successful attempt after a plethora of failures I managed to get the required luck and what needs to happen here is mainly just avoiding damage at the end through bad AI move selection. What a strategy. The final parts of my winning attempt Onyx goes for a bide and after some poison stings I'm barely hanging on. It goes for a screech and then it goes for a bide and this allows me four to five turns to go for what was honestly a Hail Mary thrash attempt to get off as much damage as possible and I just get a crit and that ends the battle. And that was the hardest part for Nidal King. The difficulty of the run is going to diminish greatly. I'm very happy with how I planned, pathed, and executed this segment of the game. And this part took a lot of resets to get to the point to where I have a time that'll allow me to be competitive with the top dogs of these solo runs. This was key to the ultimate final time that we'll see at the end of the video. And honestly it was really impressive since most normal move Pokemon do awful on Brock. Even Giratina didn't do great. After fleeing from rabid hordes of Zubats and Geodudes in Mount Moon, that leads us to Cerulean and straight to rival number 2. I actually lose the first attempt and it's surprisingly not because of Sand Attack. I avoid any of of those but the problem is that I want to use thrash and my eagerness means that I blow my load a little bit too early and that results in some chip damage I self-inflict confusion on myself and I just fizzle out and I go down like the dog that I am on the second attempt I played this moveset what I feel is the correct way and that's utilizing horn attack to the first half and then once the fight gets towards the end then you utilize thrash as the closer honestly I probably could have thrashed a little bit earlier in this attempt I'm a little bit skittish after the the last one so I play this a little bit more conservative. Either way the result is a victory here. The proceeding route towards Bills is uneventful but let me quickly say what makes Nidal King an absolute monster from here on out. It has a great move pool but more importantly it has a ton of power points and this thing never has to heal. This behemoth goes through extraordinary stretches of the game without visiting a focus center and this is the single biggest reason that it dominates the game as hard as it's going to moving forward. I've spoken on this being the common trait for the higher tier runs but I need to emphasize it strongly since Nidoking is the best that I've ever seen in these runs at least so far. 
This ultimately brings us to Misty, and I'm weak to water, so how is this one gonna go? Well, the first attempt is going pretty great. I blast through the star you with a horn attack, and even on the star me, I'm tanking multiple super effective moves like a champ, but a bubble beam is too much to overcome, and I have to reset. The second attempt, I just say fuck it, and I give in to my primal thrash impulses, and I go for it right from the star, and here you can see it's raw power. It plows through the star you, and I do take some damage from the star me, but thrash just can't be outpaced, and I take this one with relative ease. This is a shining example of when Thrash is at its best and that's two badges down. Afterwards, it's time for a trip down to the SSN and as per usual, I pick up Body Slam immediately. I also pick up the rare candy locked behind the gentleman before moving on to rival number three. And this is going to start becoming a reoccurring theme after the rough early game up to and including Brock. Since then, I've done the bare minimum in terms of battle and I start this fight at a pretty healthy level advantage. This isn't a flawless victory but it is pretty easy. It's unfortunate that the initial body slam can't one hit the Pidgeotto, but it's not an issue and I just slice to the rest of his team. It's hard to tell at this early point, but I'm impressed with Nidal King's ability to tank super effective moves in the couple of rival fights that I've done and for Misty. After seeing the SSN off, it's time to face Lieutenant Surge and the ground typing makes this one of the easier fights in the entire game, as you would probably expect. I enter this fight without wasting any healing items just to prove a point. The first two Pokemon can get some damage in, but fun fact, Raichu actually cannot damage you since it only knows three electric moves and growl, it doesn't really get much easier than this. And that's three badges down, but more importantly, that's access to Thunderbolt, which is the first piece to Nidal King's A plus grade moveset that we'll quickly start assembling soon. From here, Rock Tunnel is once again uninteresting and skippable since we have Bubble Beam, Thunderbolt, and Body Slam for everything else. I would make an execute comparison but I just don't feel like getting sad and remembering barrage that I had to use for five hours last week. Now let's pick up back in Celadon where the game opens up a little bit. Once there I immediately head towards the rocket hideout before I do any other extracurricular activities since I'm well equipped to make this one easy. This leads us to the first Giovanni fight. Bubble Beam shines in this fight as water or grass moves tend to do against his Onyx and Rhyhorn and Thrash is good enough to close us out against Kangaskhan. It's another easy match but honestly lots of things will Will be for Nidal King going forward. Now it's time to complete our Celadon errands. I pick up fresh water for the guards and another one gives us access to Ice Beam to give us even more superb coverage looking ahead. I pick up Fly, I head back to Lavender, I learn Ice Beam, and I prepare for the rival number four fight. And we already know that rival number four is always easy. Even the awful Pokemon have an easy time on this fight. With a current moveset of Body Slam, Thunderbolt, Bubble Beam, and Ice Beam, it's not a secret how strong we are at this point in time. And take into account the level advantage, this one is a massacre. I have super effective answers for all of his Pokemon, minus the Kadabra, who is basically a piece of paper as far as Body Slam is concerned, and this one is over very quickly. I finish the tower and then I make a very fast detour into Silphco to pick up Earthquake and nothing else. I'm saving as much time as possible so I don't even go to the third floor to clear the path for the future return back here. Earthquake nearly completes our moveset. It's our premier move. It's very powerful and it has same type attack bonus. I learn it immediately and from there I opt to head down to Fuchsia because Razor Leaf from Erica still kind of scares me a little bit. I pick up the hidden items on Cyclone Road and after that I do pick up the final HMs in the game in the safari zone. I learned surf by replacing bubble beam and honestly, I don't love Surf, but when it comes to Nidal King's fourth move slot, it's about as good as you're gonna get. Next up is Koga, and there's a reason I decided to come here before taking on Erica, and that reason is that I got that beefy stabbed Earthquake against his Poison Tops. I don't take any damage in the fight, and in fact, I level up during the battle, so I come out with even more health than when I started. There's not much interesting commentary here, outside of doing huge super effective damage and knocking down his team like bowling pins. Now I take a brisk swim down to Cinnabon, bar and I make this decision mainly because I decided on Surf in the final moveset and I think Surf with Earthquake coupled with Blaine's bad AI will be quicker to get through than Erica although it probably would be kind of close. Either way after some Doomstoner brother I proceed to Blaine without doing any extra battles. To start this battle off, Surf doesn't one hit the Growlithe and you might be wondering why I'm not utilizing Earthquake and that's because Nidal King barely heals and I'm trying to preserve power points as much as possible so I can avoid the Poke Center, which I've only done four times by the way. The rest of the battle was predictable and eventually as I make my way towards the evolved and more powerful Pokemon, I do switch over to Earthquake to finish this one off. Nidal King is really growing on me as the run went on and I'm very invested in how it closes out the game. 
game. Immediately after, I go clean up unfinished badge business with Erica. Since I waited towards the end of the game to tackle this gem, it's an easy one and you might expect that. I'm level 40 against a team of Pokemon in their 20s. I also have Ice Beam which can one hit the first two Pokemon and Bob Plume to my surprise does hang on but it goes down on the next turn. Another gem falls and that leaves just one place left to go. And that's to Silphco where runs make or break themselves. I dipped in here earlier for Earthquake so let's just pick up immediately at rival number 5. I wouldn't say I expected to do bad in this fight but I will say that I didn't expect to absolutely dominate like I did. I have excellent answers with Nidoking King's top tier moveset, but what really surprises me the most is that I don't even take any damage in this fight. Just like with Koga, I level up mid battle and I actually come out with more. And for most runs, this is generally a really tough challenge and it's just really impressive. I haven't had to go in depth on commentary with Nidoking King in a while, and the only thing to note about this fight is that Blastoise did survive a move, so it took two to go down, and it could have potentially done some damage with Water Gun, but its AI had a 66% chance to use either withdraw or the pathetic bubble and it chooses withdraw before getting put down. This is about the time in the run where I was looking at the end game time and I was wondering if maybe Nidoking King had a good chance here. Next up, next up is the always unimpressive and anticlimactic Giovanni number two who is lucky I even put him in the video. With our moveset and what we just done to the previous rival battle, this one is just a speed bump in the road as Nidoking King cruises along in what has been a pretty great run so far. And speaking of speed bumps, it's time for Sabrina. You might be thinking, wow, the psychic type against your poison type might be tricky, but listen up, son. I have a stabbed earthquake against all these frail spoony boys, and the key here is that I outspeed all of her Pokemon, chief among them the Alakazam, and all it takes is a single earthquake for each of her Pokemon to go down. And that's seven gems down, and there's only one left to go, and that's the final showdown with Giovanni that we just wiped the floor with. As I'm writing the script and cutting down the footage, I'm kind of realizing how much of a monster Nidoking King is during the regular season run run and that it leaves little room for compelling commentary and I hope it doesn't hurt the viewing experience but you expect the second stage fully evolved Pokemon to dominate right? Did anyone expect a huge struggle? And you can comment down below tell me how you feel about these how fast runs compared to other runs where I struggle. Do you guys hate these how fast runs? Just let me know. Before rival number six I almost make a huge mistake and I forget to turn in the teeth to the warden for strength and it would be a shame to make a mistake this late into the run right? Now it's time for rival number six and keep in mind that I've been doing minimum battles so most of his Pokemon are either at or higher than my level so let's dive into the first attempt because this is always a good test. Pidgeot is first and I do outspeed. A Thunderbolt can't get the job done but it goes for an agility followed by and you guessed it another agility since it's psychic type and the good AI thinks it's super effective. A follow up Thunderbolt moves us on. Things continue to look easy for us on the next two Pokemon. Rhyhorn and Growlithe are both weak to Earthquake and it's a one shot while they don't get a chance to do anything in return and we are looking good. Next up is Execute and Nidoking King has a tool in its toolbox for all situations and it pulls out the Ice Beam but unfortunately it doesn't one shot. It spends its one and only turn charging up for a solo beam which probably would have hurt but we'll never know because it doesn't get the chance to get it off. Next up is Alakazam and this one can always be scary and even more so if you're weak to Psychic like us. It outspeeds us but it only goes for Reflect. This means that the Earthquake does not one hit it, it only does about half of its health. The next turn it decides that it wants to try to set up the legendary double reflect strategy like an idiot and it just gets taken out with a follow up earthquake. Finally, we've reached the blast toys that now has hydro pump and I make a mistake here by going for earthquake. It's powerful, but Reflect is already set up and Thunderbolt would have been much stronger. It goes for Withdrawal and I decide to go for Earthquake again because I'm stupid. Thankfully, it does another Withdrawal and I finally get a little bit smart and I finish it off with the Thunderbolt. Hydra would have done heavy damage, but I'm not sure how much it would have done, but I take this fight on the first attempt and Nidal King is looking unstoppable right now. And remember earlier when I said I remembered strength and it would be a shame to make a mistake like that? Well, I never bought Max Repels to get through Victory Road. I tried to make it through anyway, but there's just so many encounters that it's actually faster to just leave, buy the Repels, then come back. This was the one single mistake I made on this run, and hopefully it doesn't cost me too much, but we'll revisit that at the end when the time is revealed. In the footage, I think I just leave the game on pause while I contemplate such a silly mistake this late in the game. I was pretty upset with myself, not gonna lie. 
why. After correcting my dumb mistake, I don't battle a single trainer in Victory Road, I zoom through it as fast as I can, and that's the beginning of the end. The Elite Four is upon us, friends. Usually, I wouldn't use my candies, but in these how fast runs, I'm not looking to waste any time. I use every candy I have going into Lorelei, and we begin our attempts at level 58. It's no secret that Nidoking King is weak to ice, and let's see if the domination can continue. The resounding answer is no. Thunderbolt does good damage on Dugong, but an Aurora Beam deals a huge chunk in return. I knock it out, then the Cloister comes in, but it can survive a Thunderbolt as well, and obviously, its Aurora Beam is going to crit and take us back to reality that Nidoking King isn't untouchable. The second attempt, you start seeing the wind condition. Being half poison type means that the Dugong does have a chance to use rest since it's a psychic type. Since we go first, if it rests, it's just a freebie and it'll go down no problem. But unfortunately, I don't think it uses rest the rest of this run. Now onto the Cloister. I get key information here that Thunderbolt is a range and can indeed one hit it sometimes. This will be pivotal in the fight moving on, but let's look ahead. Slowbro is next and a Thunderbolt will be a two hit here. There's only three moves that the Slowbro will do. Withdraw is the best case scenario which we actually get here, but it can do Amnesia, which is also good, or it can do Water Gun, which probably wouldn't hurt that bad. Either way it goes, this is probably the weak link in the fight. Jinx is third, I do outspeed it, and an Earthquake can just one hit it. There's no analysis on this one, it's always going to be this way if I choose Earthquake. Last up is Lapras, and it's a tanky little Loch Ness monster. Thunderbolt takes it to about half health, and I take a ton of damage from Blizzard, and I decide to go with Earthquake, but it turns out to be a mistake because it does survive, and it takes me out with a Blizzard. I think the Thunderbolt would have taken it out here, but at least we learned a little bit about the fight. Third attempt, I get all the wrong things to happen. I take two Aurora Beams making my way through the fight, and then I make the bizarre decision to go for Surf on the Jinx, and I just get taken out by an Ice Punch because I deserved it. I was really confused looking back at the footage. I was trying to see if maybe I took an attack drop from the Aurora Beam, and I didn't, so I must have been drunk on this attempt. There's, that's the only explanation. I must have had a couple of shots. And finally, I get passed on the fourth attempt. I take an Aurora Beam, but I bolt down the gong, and then I get the high roll on Thunderbolt to avoid further damage on the Cloister. Slowbro isn't a threat like I already mentioned, but it goes down to two Thunderbolts, and I sober up afterwards, and I remember that Earthquake can one-hit the Jinx, and that moves us on to the last Pokemon. On the Lapras, I get a critical hit to bring it low enough to trigger a retroactive potion, and that pretty much makes this a free win because I can just finish it off next turn. Even if I didn't crit, I could have survived a Blizzard, and I think a second Thunderbolt would have done the job even without it. So you can see how this fight is going to go from now on. So if I fail later, I'm not going to show Lorelai anymore. I don't have to keep showing these attempts. I'm not a fan of bogging down the video with 20 or 30 minutes of it dedicated to the Elite Four, so I'm trying to make a smooth run, not drag on longer than it needs to. Next up is Bruno, and I'm just going to take a break from talking for a few while I wipe the floor with this amateur. And if this is your first video, welcome to Bruno. Agatha is third, and thankfully after Lorelai, I get some easy battles. Her whole team is weak to Earthquake, and without over-explaining it about 20 times at this point, just know that a stabbed Earthquake is going to rout her entire team, minus the ground immune Golbat, and we have our pick of Ice Beam and Thunderbolt for that. I essentially one-hit everything, and my speed is good enough to not even take any damage throughout this one. It's a very clean victory, and we're moving on towards the end. Lance is the penultimate fight in this run, and it's been a minute since we had a poison type against Lance. First let's get to the Gyarados before I talk about that. I hate Gyarados and he's often the main antagonist of my runs, but I do outspeed him. I have access to Thunderbolt, so that's that. You can bother me on a different run, maybe next week, but not this week. Since it's been about two months, I'll explain it again. We're Poison Types. The two Dragonairs and the Dragonites will always go for Agility since I'm Poison Type, and Agility is a Psychic Type move, so there's no threat from those. A Weedle could win a fight against two Dragonairs and a Dragonite. That's how broken the AI is in Generation 1. Now with that said, I outspeed and just Ice Beam them down anyway, so they don't even get off a move. The Air Dash is really fast, but it goes for a couple of bites. It's not too bad. No concern here. Overall, this is an almost unlosable fight barring some awful luck, and we are just cruising after that initial Lorelei struggle, and I can smell the victory in the air, guys. You smell it? The champion fight is all that stands in our way. He leaves with Pidgeot, and it takes two Thunderbolts to take this bird out of the air.
there, I get a meaningless paralysis proc, and I take a small bit of damage from a wing attack before moving on. Alakazam is next, and I'm worried, but surprisingly I outspeed it and an earthquake just one-shots it. The takeaway from this run is that all of the Alakazams that could potentially one-hit me with Psychic were never a threat, and that was perhaps the most surprising thing about this run. Rhydon is up next, as is the Arcanine. I love that they are back to back when I have a super effective answer because that means I can save about 10 seconds of editing and keep their clips together. One earthquake for each is all it takes. Executor is next and it's not a threat but it's so tanky towards special attacks that it can actually tank three ice beams before going down which is pretty impressive. Hypnosis is what it'll try to go for the most since it's psychic type but it just misses twice and it goes down without even putting a tear in my eye by hitting me with a barrage for old time's sake. Never forget execute guys. Last up is blast toys and who knows what we'll get here. Turn one I start off the action with the earthquake for good damage and I prepare for the worst but it just uses withdrawal. That means it's time to switch to thunderbolt and I finish off the run in style with a critical hit to shut down any potential hydro pump shenanigans. And that's it. Little King did the run. I was personally very impressed and it felt good to relive that childhood nostalgia of Nidoking's King's wide and adaptable moveset. There were very few spots in the run that it didn't dominate and I'm sure everyone just wants to know exactly how it did and I've hid the time throughout the video so let's do the reveal right now. Nidoking King finishes with a level of 62 and, can I get a drum roll here, a total time of 2 hours and 38 minutes. That means Nidoking King is now the king of the Generation 1 How Fast series. Honestly guys, I thought Mewtwo could be Alakazam, and that was it. When I skimmed through potential candidates for these runs, Nidoking King never even crossed my mind. Its stats don't jump off the page, and it only has normal moves for Brock, and I immediately wrote it off doing those elite top tier times. Keep in mind that I also wasted time by forgetting those max repels after I walked from rival number 6 to Victory Road, and this run could probably be a minute or two faster. I'm not going to redo the run over that, but just keep that in mind if I manage to beat this time, I can actually actually get a little bit faster. Honestly, Middle King was incredible. It's amazing that smart pathing at the start kept its Brock time competitive and from there I only healed five times the entire game and I just rolled over everything. I didn't even have a problem until Lorelei and I think I probably could have done that on the second attempt if I just went for Thunderbolt rather than Earthquake on the Lapras. Nidoking King owes its success to its deep reserve of PP in the early game to keep it from using Poke Centers and that's its biggest strength but the thing that pushes it over the the top it's just how deep its move pool is for a pokemon to compete at this level and be considered the best i think you're gonna have to have either psychic or earthquake preferably with stab and then in a perfect world you would have thunderbolt and ice beam and i'm really not sure what the perfect fourth move would be but serve for quick access to blaine made sense since i generally wait for the free silphco lapras for that i would say maybe a badge boosting move would be the fourth slot but in these how fast runs you're looking for speed rather than taking turns to set up. You normally don't need to set up with these high stat Pokemon. And that's about it for me. And honestly, I think it's about time to finally stop messing around and see how Mew and Mewtwo can do. I have a sneaking suspicion that Mewtwo can crush this time since it starts off with Psychic, but Mew is a little bit more interesting. It starts off with only Pound. We know Pound's awful. It learns Transform at level 10, but then after that, after the Brock segment, it can learn every single TM and has a perfectly balanced stat line with 100 in each stat. Anyways, that's about it for me. I'm rambling at this point. It's 4am when I'm recording this audio and it's time to go to bed. If you made it this far, especially past my post-credit rambling, you're a real one and I appreciate you, but I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.